Let me give you the brief outline of where we're going tonight. We're going to start out with just some general thoughts on teaching. Then we're going to take a quick dive into Blackboard because that's our learning management system. It's the easiest way to communicate with students, to keep track of grades, uh, has a lot of features. We don't expect you to be able to use all of them, but we're going to show you some of the easiest things to do. So we hope that'll make your teaching easier. Uh, we're also going to talk a little about the philosophy of teaching in general, and then we're going to wrap up with uh, practical tips, uh, just some things you may or may not have thought about, and of course, we'll end with questions and answers. So having said that, I'm going to take just a second to uh, uh, try and contextualize this adventure you're going on. You know, we, we like to think of our students as being just like us when we were that age, and you're going to have some students like that. But you're also going to have some students who are very different from you. And one of the great opportunities that I've experienced in my, uh, I shouldn't say this, 37 years of teaching at the university level is every student I've ever had knows more than me about something. So I love the teaching process because I can pulse from them. And at the end of the term, I know more and I, I have as much benefit. So it's a great opportunity. Along the way, something we all have to keep in mind is the idea that all of our students are adults. You know, I've heard people occasionally refer to uh, students as kids or even children. We don't like to say that in the Center for Teaching Excellence because we know you have to be an adult in order to be a student at USC. Uh, so the adults that you encounter in your classroom, if we treat them as adults, that's going to change the way we interact with them. And it can play a role in making your teaching more effective and making a greater impact. Um, we have to think about time. I mean, consider you're only going to have, uh, at best, about three hours a week for the next 15 weeks with these students. Um, what can you really do in 40 to 45 hours? Well, part of what you want to do, as time permits, is plan out your schedule. So you're making use of that time because that's the most limited resource you have. But not only that, consider that you have an expectation that students are going to be doing uh, three to six hours worth of work outside of class every week. So you want to be creating assignments. You want to be creating group activities, other things that have your students working on the material. So not only are you presenting things to them, but they have a chance to apply and build their knowledge so they can move things to long-term memory. And we have to think about that for a second. You know, a lot of people uh, are used to going to corporate presentations where you see PowerPoints and uh, at the end, well, just give us the PowerPoint, then I don't have to take notes. I always tell my students what, or my, my student teachers, whatever you do, don't give copies of the PowerPoint in a class because then students have to take notes. And it's, it's a real practical thing. If we can get students to move things from short-term memory to long-term memory, and the way we move things from short-term memory to long-term memory so they'd be able to access what you're teaching them next week or next month, or better yet, when they're working next year or the year after, they have to process it. And one of the best ways to process is taking notes. Another way of processing the information, uh, obviously, is through the assignments you're creating. Um, and you're going to find engagement is going to be discussed a lot because we know the more engaged students are, the more they're processing the information that you're creating. So you need to think about all of these as ways that uh, uh, you can conceptualize what you're doing. What it comes down to is trying to make sure you have a style and a philosophy of teaching. And that requires not a lot of thought, although there are a lot of people who put years of thought into it. But if we don't think about what type of teacher we are, we usually default to our first teacher, probably one of our parents. Uh, if you have a, a great parent, in my case, it was uh, my mother, if, uh, she's very nurturing, if she's very uh, accommodating, if she, in, engaging, you'll probably end up that way as a teacher. But if your first teacher was a little stern or didn't pay much attention, or maybe you uh, had too many siblings, you know, there are a lot of things. You don't want to default 
to a pattern that wouldn't be as constructive. So one of the things you want to do is you want to think about who are the best teachers you've had? Not who are your favorite teachers, because sometimes you have a favorite teacher because they're funny or you like hanging out with them, but think about the teacher that actually taught you the most. Let, let's do a quick thing. You've got the chat box open. Everybody's had a chance to type in information on who you are. Think about what made that teacher you're thinking about right now the best teacher. What made them the best? Go ahead and just type in a couple of words and let's see what it is that you think makes a good teacher. Okay, I see engaging, enthusiastic, well-prepared, open, compassionate, responsive. I love these. Enthusiasm, breaking down sizable chunks, and personalizing, personal attention, storytelling. Oh my God, the storytelling. Good storytellers make great teachers because people remember stories. They love teaching. They challenge. All right, someone who listens and is willing to learn. Well, here's the thing I want to point out. You're describing 10 or 20, I guess I'm looking, 46 different people. So the place I want to take you now is thinking, it's not a matter that you, there is a perfect model of teaching. Rather, it is, what is the great model of teaching for you? And there's an art to it that you develop over time. But there are also skills. What we're going to focus on for the next hour or so is the skill side. But I want you to think about Every time you interact with anyone, maybe it's in a corporate presentation, or maybe it's thinking back on a teacher. Think about what do you want to take from that person to build, to make yourself more effective? And I have a real practical reason for saying that. I like our students to be really well-educated because I want them all to go out and get really good jobs so they will pay more taxes, and those taxes will allow a bigger state budget so I can get a raise because I'm a university faculty member. So you've got to find what is the motivation that you have that you want to motivate the students to do more. So that's where we want to start. So that's uh, uh, the place I want to take you. So I want you to think about how you're going to uh, develop the style and realize nobody expects you to be perfect. We expect you to be you. We expect you to connect with your students. And what you're going to find is if you have adjuncted more than once or if you're doing this again and again, you'll keep adding to your teaching repertoire. It's like using Blackboard. Blackboard's got, last time I looked, 164 features. Nobody can possibly use all of them. But if you add one or two things every term, then eventually you're building and building. So with that as an entree, I'd like to introduce our Blackboard export, expert for the night. Uh, Aisha Haynes is the Assistant Director of the Center for Teaching Excellence. She also is a fellow instructor. She uh, serves as an adjunct uh, faculty member, uh, not only on this campus, but on other U of SC campuses. Um, has her doctorate in education, so she really knows of what she speaks, and is the uh, head of our instructional design team. So, Aisha, I will uh, turn it over to you to introduce Blackboard. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, and welcome to Adjunct Faculty Orientation. I hope that you are all able to hear me okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and discuss Blackboard, and I, which is our learning management system. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my application window. Okay, so I see that it's up now. To access Blackboard, which I mentioned is our learning management system, you will go to blackboard.sc.edu. And before I begin, I would like to say that I am a person who stutters, but that just means that it may take you a little bit longer to hear all of my brilliant ideas. All right, so to log into Blackboard, you will click login once going to blackboard.sc.edu and you will enter your network username. As you will see here on the right of the screen, your network username is the first portion of your university's email address. And I see that many of you have been entering your email address. So your network username will be the first part of your network of your university email address. 
So mine is Haynes A, and I'll go ahead and type in my, my password. The first thing that will pop up is the institution page, and this will give you announcements, so some up-to-date information about Blackboard and a variety of other things that are happening on, on campus. As you will see here, there is an announcement about some back-to-school Blackboard training. So you may be interested in learning more about Blackboard, and you can do so by accessing these trainings. When you click your name, you will see your profile. You will see some information about yourself. You can also change some global notification settings here on the right. You can also edit or add a picture of yourself by clicking the pencil and then uploading a new profile picture. So this will be your profile picture for Blackboard. Again, that's under your name. And then there's a pencil for you to upload your picture. There's also a tab for courses where you will see the courses that you are teaching. There are different views for viewing your, your courses. There's a list view. And there's also an original view. So you can choose the way that you would like to see your courses. You can also search for courses, filter courses as well. If you click here at the top where it says current courses, you will see that courses are bunched in various semesters. So you can go to your course in another semester if you taught, with, taught these before. Another good thing is that you can favorite a course by clicking the star that's to the right of, of your course, and that will move it under favorites. If you don't want a course to be your favorite anymore, you can uncheck the star to remove it from your favorites. So this allows you to, to see a courses that you want to see right here in the middle of your, your screen. All right, to access your course, you will click your course. I'm going to go into my training course here. And you will see the Blackboard template that is automatically there for you. I would like to point out first on the upper right hand, upper right hand corner that you can enter student preview if you would like to see your course as a student sees your, your course. You can click enter student preview to view the preview that a student will see for your course. And once you're done, you can click Exit Preview and then Continue. You can also make your course unavailable if you do not want students to have access to your course at a certain time. And you can make it available again. You can also show your course in edit mode off. Automatically is edit mode on, but you can also view your course with edit mode off. Here on the right, you will see a list of the Blackboard main menu items. One good thing is that you can modify these items. So let's just say right here is home page. You can click the arrow next to the item and you can rename the link. You can hide the link. You can also delete the link if you do not want students to. You can also delete the link. You can also change the order of items by dragging them up and down on the screen. Or you, you can click this up and down arrow here at the top and change the order of your menu items as well. And then once you're, you are done, you can click Submit. You may see some boxes on the right of your items. If you see the box, this means that there is no content within the item. So I'm hoovering my mouse over here, and it says this link has no content. So if I access this particular part of the course, I will see that there is no content. As I mentioned, you can hide a link. 
When you hide a link, you will see a box with the line through it. That means that this link is hidden from your students and they cannot see it. So if you ever see this box with this line, this means that this means that your students cannot see this particular link. All right, so I'm going to go to one of the parts. I'm going to go to one of the links here. And you will see that there are a variety of things that you can add within content areas of Blackboard. Here is the build content section. There's also an assessment section, a tool section, as well as a partner content section. Right now, I'm currently in the syllabus and schedule section of this course. And let's just say I would like to add my syllabus to my course. You can simply click build content and then item. You can name it syllabus. You can add some text if you would like. You will then click browse local files under attach files and find your syllabus. You can double, double click it. Here you can permit users to view the content or, or not. You can also track the number of views and set date and time restrictions. Once you have added your information, you can simply click submit. And as you will see here, my syllabus is now within my course. If you click the arrow to the right of syllabus, there are a variety of options. You can edit to make changes. You can make it unavailable. You can also de delete it. And there's some other things here as well. So that is how you add an item a document to your course. Are there any questions so far? All right, so I'm gonna go to another part of my course, the course content section that's here. I'm going to show you how to add a content folder. So you may want to create content folder to and, and have that folder and then put additional information within that folder. So again, this is under build content. Under new page, you will click content folder. You will name the folder. You can add some text if you would like, and then you will click submit. Now you will have a folder. You will see the folder icon here on the left. To add items to a folder, you will simply, simply click the folder, and then you will have those same options as before to build, to add content, assessments, etc. Let's just say I would like to add a web link in the folder. So again, I'm going to go to build content and then web link. So I'm going to type the name for my web link and then a URL. And you'll need to type the HTTP colon slash slash before the URL. And then once you have your URL there, you can click submit. And now you have added a URL, a web link to your course. You can also add audio, images, videos, and a variety of other things here as, as well. Let's just say I would like to add a YouTube video to, to YouTube video to my course. So again, build content, YouTube, YouTube video. I'll search for a video. You can click select for that video. You can add a description if you would like, and then you can click submit. You can also pre preview the video or click sub submit. And so then you will have a YouTube video embedded here within your, your course. So that is a way how to, so these are ways how to add a, a, a link as well as a YouTube video within your, your, within your, your course. Are there any questions about that? Yes, you, yes, you, you can also cut and paste a 
link from a web browser as well for YouTube videos. That, that, that can be done as well. So that would be pretty simple. Um, if you find a YouTube video that you would like and add a link by copy and pasting the, the link, you can go to web link as we did before, give it a name and then paste the URL here. Uh -huh. You are welcome. All right, so now I'm just going to go ahead and go to the assignment section here in, in the course and show you how to add a test. You will add test under assessments. So you will click assessments and then you will click test. You will then click create to create a test and you will give your test a name. You can also provide a description as well as instructions for your students, and then you will click Submit. Blackboard has 17 different types of questions that you can add. So you will add your questions here. You can also reuse questions and upload questions as well. I'm going to go ahead and create a multiple choice question. I'm just going to type some, some letters here for, for time's sake. You can show answers in random order. And then you can enter your answer choices and then select the button for the correct answer choice. And then you will click submit. So then you will have a multiple choice question. You can continue to add additional questions here. And you can change the point value of questions over here to the right. One key thing is that once you add a test in Blackboard, you will need to add it also to the content area. So you create a test first, but then you have to deploy it to a content area. So I'm going back to my assignments, going back to assessments and then test. And I'm going to select the test that I just created, and I'm going to click Submit. This is where you make your test available to students. You can allow multiple attempts. You can set a timer. You can set date and time restrictions. If you have students in your course who need extra time to take a test, maybe someone with a disability, or if you need to extend time for someone else, you can click add user or group and add that one particular student. You can also select a due date for when your test is due and students will see the due date in their grade center. There are also, there, there are also a variety of, re, variety of results and feedback that you can share with, with your students. You can also randomize your questions and have questions appear one at a time. So once you're done with that, you will click Submit. And you will see your test here, and it will be available for your students to take. Any questions about adding a test? All right. I'm going to also show you how to add an assignment. Well, one thing about tests before I get to assignments is that whenever you create a test, a grade center column for that test is already is, is automatically entered into your, your grade center. So whenever you create a test, a grade center column is automatically created for that test. And the same is true for assignments. So if you were to create an assignment, a grade center column will automatically be, be created in your grade center for you. When students upload their assignments, you can grade them all in the grade center. So this is much better than having students email you assignments. They can upload their assignments to Blackboard in the assignment feature, and you can grade them all there. So I'm going to go to assessments and then assignment. You can give your assignment a name. You can attach a file if you would like. You can give it a due date. You need to enter the points possible. Blackboard has built in rubrics that you can uh, create right here in Blackboard. Under submission details, you can allow individual submissions, group submissions. You can allow multiple attempts. 
Uh, one great tool here is that you can check the submission for plagiarism using Safe, safe Assign. So you can see if someone um, is, is is doing is uh, is is doing some is uh, is is play, play is play plagiarism is plagiarizing. Then you can do that here, um, and also some grading options and display grade options here. And again, you can limit the availability for when students will see the particular assignment. Then you will click submit, and as I mentioned. The test and assignment feature will automatically create a grade center column for you. Any questions about assignments? Is it possible for students to upload videos as a submission? Um, yeah, well, let's let's see. So um, They, I believe, hold on, one, one second. I know they can add web links if they if they have a web link, like a YouTube, vid, a YouTube video. Um, but I'll have to check to see if they can actually upload it like an MP4 file. I know that they, they can add a web link that may be a video, but I have to check to see if they can actually up, upload an MP4 file. I, I know that Casey is here as well. So he may be able to answer that. I don't think that they can, but um, I'll look it up. OK, thank you, Casey. All right, and then we have a link here for Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, which is the tool that we are currently using for this, uh, set, for have, this, set, this session. Go, go ahead. Yeah, before you uh, move on, Nate had his hand up. I think he might have some uh, an answer. All right, Nate. Uh, yes, uh, actually, for one of our key assessments in the uh, degree program that I teach, they do upload videos. However, it does depend on the size of the video. We have found that it's better, as Casey, I think, was mentioning, that they can just give us the link to where that video is. Because, for example, some people put up YouTube videos. Uh, and there's a variety of formats that you can use for that. But they can also just paste the link there that takes you right to where they need to go. But yes, thank, thank, yes. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Nate. And that's what I do for my class. My students actually create create videos and they upload those videos to, to YouTube or to their university's Office 365 account and paste the link in, in the assignment that feature. So I would, I would re recommend YouTube or another uh, way for students to, to um, share their share their, their video via a, a hyperlink. All right. So um, next is Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, and that's what we're currently using now. And this is a great tool for doing live live video conferencing, or if you would like to do some virtual office hours. It's already here for you. It's already here for your students. So you will click Blackboard Collaborate Ultra in Blackboard. Students will click Blackboard Collaborate Ultra as well. There's already a course room here that is created that you can use to access Blackboard Collaborate Ultra, or you can create additional sessions. So it's pretty simple. You'll click the uh, three dots with the circle over here on the right and click Join Course Room. And while that comes up, um, up here on the left, this is where you start the recording. You can actually use your phone for audio if your um, if your microphone is not working. And this is also where you leave the, the session. Um, and as you all know, on the right here, as you've been seeing, uh, you can use the chat. Students can you can also see see an attendee list. You can share a whiteboard, application screen, camera, files. You can do polling, have breakout groups, and there are also some additional settings here. So once again, this is already built into Blackboard, um, so you and your students can easily access it here. There's also an easy way to send email. If you click send email, you can send email to all your students. You can do single select students, groups, 
et cetera. Here is an easy way for students to check their, their grades and also for them to complete their course evaluation. Um, under course tools, there are a variety of different tools. But one I'm going to point out is the photo roster, where you can see a list where you can see the picture of all the students who are enrolled in your course. And we have our great moderators here, Nate, Tina, as well as Augie. Uh, so they are here in, in my course. So you can see a photo roster of students who are in your course. Again, that's under course tools and then photo roster. I've already gone to the grade center, but here's the grade center again, where you can see the students who are in your course and your, your grades. Students will be able to see that once you enter grades, students will be able to see their, their grades. Um, it's simple to create a column, to, to, to create a grade center column. Can't really spell today, but you get the gist of it. And then you can click Submit once you enter the points possible. And the Grade Center column will be created for you. One good thing is that you can uh, change the order of the items in your Grade Center column um, by clicking Column Organization and then moving the items up and down here. And then clicking Submit. Again, that's under Manage and then Column Organization. All right, so that, oh, users in, in groups is a good feature as well. That's when you can see all of the users in your course. You can also find users to en enroll. So if you want to add a TA to your course, or if you want to add someone else to, to add another instructor or someone to, to your course, you can click find users to enroll. You can enter their username. You can change their role here. If you don't know their username, then you, then you can click browse and search by first name, last name, or email address. And then you will click submit. So that is how you enter. So that is how you en enroll. If you want to enroll a TA or someone else within your, your course. So that's this. Now I'm going to show you all. We actually have a master remote, a master temp, temp, template that, that you can use that already has boilerplate link language. And it's broken off into three different segments, a getting started section, a course content section, section as, well as, as well as a resources sec section. Um, and we can, as instructional, as instructional designers, we can copy this template into your course and as I mentioned, it already has boilerplate language and it'd be helpful to, to you. So if you would like for this to be copied into your course, then feel free to contact us at the CTE and we can copy this template within your course. And lastly, um, and on the CTE's web website, uh, you, you can consult with an instructional, de, de, an, an instructional de designer to help you to de design your course, whether it's face-to-face, -face, blended, or on online. And if you have any questions about Blackboard, you can give them a call at 777-1800 or submit a service ticket at sc.edu slash ithelp. So that is what I have. Um, so we look forward to working with you all, looking forward to, to consulting with consulting with, with you. And, and I hear someone has their hand raised. Hi, Casey. It's me. Um, hi. Mm -hmm. hi, everybody. I'm Casey Carroll. I'm one of the instructional designers. Uh, Brooke had a question um, about uh, teaching blended. Um, so I figured since she might not be the only one teaching blended, we could um, address that for her. Um, this is her question. So she wants to know, um, so for all of you who don't, blended means you will you will be physically in a specific classroom. Some of your students will be in the classroom with you. Some of, will, some of them will be participating online. 
and then most likely on the second day that week they will swap and they will uh, be half and half. Um, so she would like to know if there is a camera in each classroom or if she should initiate Blackboard Collaborate using her laptop camera for those participating online. Okay. Yes, I believe that all classrooms have cameras in them. Um, so if you would like to use Collaborate in your class, then you should be able to. All, all here, Nate, you all may know some additional information about the cameras that are in, in the classes. Yeah, the uh, uh, D D Division of Information Technology purchased 500 cameras and computers over the summer and installed them in almost every classroom. Some are simple uh, webcams, but a lot of them are what they call the PTZ cams that will pan or tilt or zoom. So you have a lot of control. So you should check with your department to see what the equipment is in the classroom, or there is a, a tool through uh, 25 Live that can tell you what's in every classroom. Again, it's easier to just ask the, whoever's coordinating the department what the equipment is in uh, the particular classroom that uh, you're going to be teaching in. Uh, and uh, but most classrooms should have uh, the cameras, so you won't need to worry about laptops, but you can check it out. I suggest if you have the, uh, the time that you visit the classroom ahead of time to test it out. Again, one of the great things about Collaborate is you can always go in at any time to your Collaborate room for any particular course and go to the video. Uh, someone also asked if you could store videos and record them. Sure. You go to Collaborate, uh, you can re hit the record button, uh, just enter your classroom, hit the record button, and it will record whatever you uh, want to record for however long you want to do it. And then when you stop the recording, you have a chance to uh, uh, name it. So it will be there on uh, the Collaborate site for the students. And by renaming it, you can put, you can actually give specific names to lectures. So if you have one, here's how to use Blackboard. Or if you have another one, um, here's how to do statistics. You know, uh, choose whatever area you're talking about. Uh, and we've got some questions about how you check students' evaluations from uh, fall class. Departments handle student evaluations, so always want to check that. And I think, Casey, you've addressed most of the other questions uh, there. So uh, keep typing the questions into the, uh, the chat box, and we've got a team standing by to respond to those. But I want to make sure we get to uh, uh, the next area, which is actual pedagogy. I mean, the practical side. How do we, how, what is teaching? And with us is uh, the person, my guru, the person I go to the most. Uh, Nate Carnes is the Associate Director for the Center of Teaching Excellence, and he's also Associate Professor in the College of Education, and again, knows more about Bloom's taxonomy than anybody on campus. So uh, he's got some very uh, uh, both conceptual and practical advice for you. Nate, take it away. Uh, thank you very much, Augie. Uh, I do want to just build on something you just said um, and so that people don't make mistakes that I have made. And that is when you use Blackboard Collaborate, uh, Casey gave a, a nice uh, response there about using Blackboard Collaborate and the camera uh, there to, to be sure that you I don't know who that is. Casey, he was the moderator. Did we just lose Nate? I think we may have lost Nate. This is one of the uh, wonderful things. Uh, 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 we're all at the uh, whims of our ISP. So once in a while, you'll have a dropout. But you'll notice that when you have a dropout, the person will usually reconnect very quickly and just pick up right where they were. and. I believe we've got Nate reconnecting right now. Um, it's, we'll blame this one on Spectrum because it's, it's always really good to uh, uh, blame any, any issue on the cable company, right? Are you back with us, Nate? Not yet. Um, Elaine asks, <laughs> we'll be able to view this recording after the session. 
yes. Uh, uh, and we'll give information on how to do that. We'll be sending an email out after the session that will have some uh, helpful information. I'll talk about that in a second. So, okay, um, okay Nate, you're back. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I, th I guess you lost me for a little bit. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, after your second sentence. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I am having connectivity issues in an area of town that Augie and I both live. <laughs> but anyway, um, there's no need to dwell on the first slide. I've already been introduced. Um, I'm going to break us up into uh, small discussion uh, uh, groups uh, here. And what I want you to do is uh, focus on, or maybe you can help me, um, Casey, if you like, since my uh, power is uh, wavering on me here a little bit. I, I would like yes, for, I, okay, I would like, yes, I, for, go ahead, Casey. Sorry, yes, I will be happy to um, do the small group. How many people do you want? Hey, well, Casey's going to be breaking you up into small small groups. Uh, we're going to break out into about 10 groups. Um, but this is what I want you to do is capture what's on the slide first before you go, because you can't take the slide with you when you go into the small group. I want you to think about, um, you know, what teaching credentials and or teaching experiences do you bring to of uh, the position to which you are assigned this semester, and then let everybody else know a little bit about who you are. Um, and I want, when you come back, I want you to be able to tell me something that you learned about the people in your group. Okay, we won't uh, call on everybody, but there will be opportunity for you to, uh, uh, for a few of you to share. And then I'm going to make my point based on that. Okay, and we'll end up with a big, broad stroke on pedagogy and then move on to Tina Marie for some practical advice. Okay, so Casey will break you up into about uh, 10 groups, into about 10 groups. And I may even talk a little bit about what he did uh, in case you don't know that. Okay, Casey. All right, everybody, ready, set, go. All right, um, just because it was difficult to get me out of eyes, Aisha and Tina, your um, uh, other people, are, <laughs> your number twos are also put into groups. So if you want to pop in and Say hey to people or um, remove yourself or something, we can do that too. But I left the moderators out. So we can oh, move okay. y'all into groups if you want to get people. Casey, I forgot an important detail, but if you would, let's bring them back in about seven minutes. Okay, sure. And then they should be able to see that. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> There's a lot to do when you have to just send them into breakout groups and you can't just like, oh wait, I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Actually, Aisha and Tina, I could probably remove your number twos from the group if you want me to. Um, um, if you care. 
So that's all right, Casey. I've um, logged out of mine. I just like to have my number two up when I'm presenting so I can kind of look and see what's going on, especially when I'm sharing my screen. So I've already logged out my number two. So thank you. Okay. Cool. Yeah, Tina, I'll go ahead and move you back to the main room. So oh, Tina, uh, sorry, I think I think I moved you on accident. Do you remember what number of groups you were in? I think it was six, perhaps. I know it was uh, um, Roxanne Price, I think, and um, Suddeth maybe was the last name. Okay, I'll try to put you back. I misunderstood uh, who you were. Um, <laughs> Did you see who's in it? Roxanne, okay. Roxanne Price, maybe. But I was the only one with audio and video in that group, but uh, you can put me wherever. Thank you, Casey. Okay. <laughs> I'm flexible. <laughs> Hi, Ken. Are you, um, can you hear us? Do you want me to put you in? Uh, I'll send you over to a group if you want to say hi to some people. Well, I'll just do it anyway. Here we go. Nate, it's been about five-ish minutes by my count. Do you want me to give a couple minute warning? Yes, that would be great, Casey. Thank you. Okay, team. Um, I'll go ahead and put you in for a couple of minutes. Nate, we're going to be tight on time, so you're going to have, it looks like, about 18, 19 minutes when you bring them back. Sure, got it.
Okay, Casey, I think we're getting close. All right. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and pull them back. So here we go. Okay. Got it. Less than 18 minutes. Oh, no. Here we go. Oh, the time. I'm sorry. Now. We need to be very specific with our students when we explain everything. Uh, okay. <laughs> Seems like we've had some great small group discussion, and it sounds like this is a, a very interactive group. I sent you, or excuse me, into a small discussion group with yeah. uh, the question that is posted. Um, we'll take maybe a couple people. Um, and yeah, so we had some people with one group, very engaged. All right, so um, briefly, is there someone or two? I needed you. There you go. Okay, I just unmuted again myself. So is there someone who would like to share something that you learned about your group members, one or two people? Just raise your hand. Go ahead, Patrick. Um, yeah, just real briefly, um, we were talking about um, just uh, how um, some of the new challenges and difficulties that have been presented with us being in kind of a virtual environment, some of the things that are very easy and simple to explain in person now have to be kind of um, revamped into the form of like pre-recorded videos or maybe like text links and stuff like that and also taking into consideration the students environments you know everybody's not in a classroom in an ideal environment to learn so taking that into consideration whenever we're um you know giving out assignments and materials and stuff like that oh great sounds great and I actually you took part of my speech that's good <laughs> Uh, someone, another person, want to raise your hand to share, and then I'll move on. No one else? Okay, go ahead, Elaine, and she will be our last one. Um, I think I learned that um, many of us um, are have other jobs, and... Um, have uh, you know but are excited about teaching and being with students um, and that uh, we're still some of us uh, struggling and uh, a little bit distressed from the coronavirus situation and so how can we help our students you know make their learning experience better and uh, make them more comfortable this session okay great great thanks for sharing excellent uh, so sounds like uh, really had some good discussion. So when we think about pedagogy, pedagogy is a very big word. Um, uh, it's it's uh, been growing on me for quite a while because uh, Augie had mentioned that he has been teaching at the university for a number of years. I have also, uh, probably not the university level as long as he has, but I have been teaching uh, a little more than 40 years now. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that because, uh, and I'm not going to get off the topic too much, but I have to tell you this. Uh, so with my little more than 40 years, uh, I did have an incident a couple years ago where students were actively involved in a small group discussion, but it was off the topic because what they were trying to do were at, was to ascertain how old I was. And, and when I approached the group, they stopped. And But the short of it is, they did share with me what they were discussing. So I said, okay, so what did you find out? Being that our topic for that day was scientific argumentation anyway. And they guessed me to be about 40 years of age. So I, said, I gave them a compliment and they asked, so did we get it? And I just left them hanging. But in that period of time, I'm always learning, uh, including, you know, more and more about pedagogy. When you look at the big umbrella of pedagogy, as you see in our slide right here. It actually uh, subsumes everything that Augie was talking about at the very beginning. What Aisha was sharing with us, 
And now I'm just trying to pull all this together because pedagogy actually has to do with uh, skills, attitudes, philosophy, dispositions that are related to teaching. And so there are uh, multiple ways to break that out. Uh, hidden, as you cannot see, here is the philosophy that really drives what we do. So I thought it was very important that Augie incorporated some questions in his um, um, brief presentation to us at the very beginning. It was very helpful that um, uh, Casey was helpful, uh, was, was uh, assisting me in breaking you into small groups because that's also part of pedagogy. It's the skill part of pedagogy, um, but it all comes together to uh, form what we do and do not do. It answers questions such as, how do we engage students? When do we engage them? What's the material with which we engage them? You know, and so content is a, a, a big piece also. In fact, it has been so important that over the years, uh, scholars have broken pedagogy down to content pedagogy. So there's this big umbrella, but then there's also a contextualized piece that fits the content that you are teaching. So what I do want to say about that, and I'm going to move from pedagogy uh, pretty soon here, um, uh, that you have lots of sources available to you. For example, the ID team here at CTE it will be here to help you in your pedagogical practices. Um, maybe not so much your content pedagogy, but I'll get to that in a minute. But you can um, contact CTE, have your question routed to one of our ID team members, like Casey, like Aisha, uh, who are not only uh, very knowledgeable about some tools that you can use, but they are, I have not seen such a group that's been so infectiously enthusiastic to help also. So that's one of your, going to be one of your sources. Another one of your sources is going to be our ongoing CTE series of workshops that you will be allowed to, to come and uh, to join and gain uh, more information that you can relate to your teaching. Many of the, the workshops uh, present material that you can take and use next class even. Um, and then some are more robust. But then we also have um, uh, toolboxes, and then I'll get to a question that's popped up from you, Kelly. Uh, we have a diversity, equity, inclusion toolbox that has uh, resources in there that you can use to meet the, the various students, the variety of students that sit in your class. Um, also, uh, we have the assessment toolbox uh, because assessment can be a real uh, twirly kind of thing, uh, but we have a, a collection of resources that you can go to and pull out and use in your classroom. And also there are experienced people in your department. Seek out those that have done well. There might be a, an instructor of record uh, for course that you teach or some individuals who seem to do very well uh, with um, uh, uh, students and the students that you have. But I had this diagram up here also for another reason. Uh, you see at the top where it says knowledge counts. This is extremely important. I'm going to be winding this up in less than nine minutes here. That uh, it, it's important to know, knowledge is extremely important to be successful, as you might imagine. Uh, so I spoke briefly about the pedagogical piece, knowing your pedagogy, knowing your content pedagogy, which is specific to your discipline, and what things really open up students' attention, what addresses misconceptions that they might have, what misconceptions do they generally have relevant relative to the topic that you're teaching, can all be a part of this. But it's also important to know the students as well, who's coming in, and that's why, uh, just personally, I spend a little bit of time at the beginning of the semester, because I still teach, 
uh, getting to know the students who are in my class because I can always assume and sometimes my assumptions can be problematic. So to reduce that assumption, I try to get to know them as best as possible. There's not enough time to go into um, the various practices. There are many. You can uh, administer a, a pretest over some material that you're going to teach. You can have them do what's called a one minute paper, which they write, uh, for example, I might have my folks write something about, so how would you distinguish between mitotic and meiotic cell division? Uh, because I'm a science teacher educator, you know, things like that. Uh, maybe make some relationship to the COVID-19 pandemic as it relates to your course. Um, or, you know, much of anything, in, in some cases, I even have them draw a picture. I won't go into the detail, but that picture does tell me a, a lot. Um, and then we have yourself. Getting to know yourself as an instructor can be extremely important in the success that you have this semester. I want to sum this part up by giving you a quote uh, from Sun Tzu, who was a third century Chinese warlord. Uh, he said, if you know yourself, I'm going the other way now, the other way. If you know yourself and you know your enemy, you have no fear of the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself and not your enemy, he continues, for every battle you win or every victory you win, you will suffer defeat. Then I want to go to the final bar, which says, if you know neither yourself nor your students, defeat is certain. Now, just think about that just for a brief moment. I don't want to posit that students are our enemies. So the question would be, what does this have to do with teaching and certainly teaching my course? OK, well, that was a wait time, Augie, <laughs> that I threw in there for you to think about that. So I'm going to give you kind of like the Carnes version, which is if you know yourself and you know your students, and you know your pedagogy, you have no fear of the result of 100 lessons. If you know yourself, but not either your students or your pedagogy, for every successful lesson, you may have an unsuccessful one. If you know neither yourself, nor your students, nor your pedagogy, you'll have a rough semester. <laughs> but I'm sure that you will dedicate yourself to getting to know yourself better, your students and your pedagogy. Now for me, for example, I call myself the chief learner in the classroom. So I make it plain to them that I'm in there to learn also. And that puts me into a, a position where I strive to demonstrate what I want them to do. Okay, so um, now I, put up what uh, I just said from Sun Tzu. So I was kind of borrowing a little bit from Augie there that uh, rather than just give you the slide or everything, some of my students are rapidly writing this kind of thing down, you know, when I'm getting that information like this. I might have my next slide where it lays everything out uh, like this. And, uh, but also I, I agree, Augie and I have had conversations about this. There is, a, there is a good deal of research that addresses the importance of students to write the information down. And I know we're living in a time and age where it's kind of like an automatic push the button, you get the information kind of stage. But does it stick? And in order for it to stick, students must do something. This comes from my dissertation years ago, uh, which was uh, under the guise of a, a theoretical framework or embodied by a theoretical framework known as constructivism. Interestingly, we now call that uh, peace constructivism, we call it active learning. It's really the same thing, but arose by a different name. Okay, so um, there's, like I said, there's a lot more uh, to say, a lot more to give, 
but I'm going to wish you the very best and try to impress upon you as much as you can, starting from day one, thinking about the pedagogy that you're going to use. Try to get to know yourself, your students, and the pedagogy, the philosophy, the tools, the dispositions that you will use as much as possible, and you're certain to have a, a successful semester. Now, I think I did see a, uh, a question a little bit earlier. Oh, it was from you, Kelly, an off-topic question uh, for the moderators. Is there a resource for the USC syllabus statements slash policies? There certainly is. Um, we have uh, syllabus templates for what's known as face-to-face -face and online uh, available at the Center of Teaching Excellence website. Um, you can go there and, and uh, take that. And the way they're designed, you can bring them right down to your, your computer and then just input information that is pertinent to your course right there. Any other burning questions before I turn it back to Augie? Um, may I ask one, please, Dr. Nate? This is um, <laughs> this is Kathleen Wynn. Yes, if we have, if we hi there, if we have a guest speaker who is outside of the university system, um, if we send them the link to our online virtual classroom, can they access it and participate? Yes, ma'am. They, they can access it, and even before you send it to them, you can make the determination of what role you want them to serve. Mm -hmm. um, most of us, we uh, choose the presenter option and send that link to them so that when they get the link and come in, they come in as presenter okay. and they can share material. Okay, yes. great. You answered my mm -hmm. question. Thank you so much. This is very helpful. And if you yeah, if you need specific information on what buttons to push, just uh, send us an email and we'll put you in touch with an instructional designer or we'll send you the step-by-step -step instructions. Augie, so. I have written every one of your names down already. <laughs> you are on my list. <laughs> thank you. Well, and thank, thank you, Wayne. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate the, uh, the presentation. I want to stress, too, another opportunity you have as an adjunct faculty member. Um, our Center for Teaching Excellence provides uh, anywhere from 50 to 80 training sessions every term. This term, it happens to be around 80. Uh, they're free. So if there's anything you're interested in, uh, just for your own benefit, uh, you can feel free to look at our catalog. We have uh, uh, our program agenda has uh, all of the topics, hot links to everything. So. There are many things that can help your teaching or many things you might, might find useful in other areas that you're working in. So uh, please feel free to use us as a resource and realize that uh, no cost ever to attend or participate. So oh, and there's the link to the workshop. See, God, the staff is good. All right, let's move on. Um, it might surprise you to know that uh, until 2019, uh, the university didn't have an orientation uh, program for adjuncts. And at that point, uh, Shelley Dempsey, who's head of the On Your Time initiatives, and I got together and we talked about, well, what could we do? Uh, uh, was there a need? And what we did was uh, uh, put together and did our first offering. And at the end of that, we had uh, one of the attendees from that session came to us and said, you know, I think there's some practical things that I'd like to share with everyone. I said, great. So with us today, it was such a good presentation. We, we, we asked uh, uh, the presenter, Tina Marie Devlin. Hi, Tina. Hey, uh, everyone. <laughs> hey, Tina. Uh, I, I want to get her, uh, her title exactly right. She is a health resource analyst, but also an adjunct instructor. She's a graduate of our own Arnold School of Public Health. Uh, not only an adjunct, one of the best communicators, and she has real practical information for you. So I'm just going to pop your slides up there, uh, Tina, and take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Augie. Thank you, and thank you to all the CTE staff um, just for everything you all do in putting this together. Um, but good evening, everyone. 
Um, again, like Augie has stated, I'm Tina Marie Devlin, and I'm just going to share just some quick tips and tools just to really um, enhance the learning experience for your students, but just ways to engage with your students. I'm going on my second year of an adjunct instructor in the um, Arnold School of Public Health, Health Promotion, um, Education and Behavior Department, and I teach a undergraduate um, 470 course. So something that's very important to me, and I know Dr. Carnes has talked about it and other um, presenters as well, but connecting with students is priority for me. You know, that's the reason why we are here. And that is something that I value and I find every opportunity to connect with them. Um, and so some of the things and I, I want to outline with my presentation, um, I've pretty much done face-to-face -face synchronous and this semester I am doing asynchronous um, teaching. So. I want to really outline some of my experience with the face-to-face -face and the synchronous. So connecting with students, something that I do is that I learn their names. And I do that within the first 45 days of class, especially with face-to-face. -face. I'm not doing that, as we all know, because of the pandemic, like many of us who are impacted. So I make sure I learn their names. And so some of the strategies that I use is that when I'm grading assignments, I will go to that Blackboard photo roster that Dr. Haynes showed at the beginning. And I make sure that I line up their photo with the name that's on the assignment, whether it's a paper they've turned in or something that's been submitted electronically and I try to make that connection when I'm in person and face-to-face -face, I do a name tent activity takes a little time at first up front a little bit of your resources but I create name tents so when the students come into the class and depending on your classroom setup I have them come to the table pick up their name and I'm standing there and I'm looking at their face I look at the name and they drop the name tent in, the, um, in a little box that I have set aside. And I do that for about the first 45 days of class. And that really helps to, um, to remember their names. So when you're in the classroom, a student raises their hand, you can say, hey, Anthony, hey, Beth, hey, Allison. And that just makes that personal connection for them. And the synchronous environment, something that I did every single class period, I taught every Monday and Wednesday last semester in the fall, is I greeted every student by name when they entered the classroom online via Blackboard Collaborate. So that meant that I had to log in about 15 to 20 minutes early to make sure technology was working. But as students logged in, I would say, hey, good morning, Carol, or hey, good morning, Dominique. And I would either type that in or I would do it through the microphone. And students love that. The evaluations that they submitted um, last fall, they indicated that that really made a connection, even in that synchronous virtual environment. Something else that I also utilize, and I want to um, also thank um, Dr. Haynes for the work that she's provided and the consultation that she's provided for me and her role in really helping me um, as an instructor and to strengthen my skills. But I use games throughout my course, and many of you may do that already. Face-to-face, -face, I implemented weekly cahoots as a review tool, and I call those Mind Game Mondays. So I tried to find a creative name, and the students knew that every Monday in class, we were going to do a Kahoot and we were going to review the previous course material. So find a creative name, Teach Back Tuesdays, etc. I would also upload those Kahoots on Blackboard in the course module section so they could always access those Kahoots that we have played in class. And that actually can serve as your reviews for any midterms or final exams or other um, assignments. In the async in the synchronous environment, I implemented a virtual game every class period. So every Monday and Wednesday, we would start off the class with some type of games. I called it daily dialogues. So the first 10 minutes, it may have been a kahoot. It may be that I would flash up a fact or an interesting question about a country on the screen, and I would have students engage in that dialogue and really talk about the topic. And sometimes the whole class period would be about that topic. If students are, if they're talking, if they're engaging, if they're challenging and exploring and inquiring, that's a great thing. I don't want to stop that. We want to continue. So sometimes those daily dialogues would take up most of the class period, and that's okay. 
I also did review and recalls. This is another way that I really wanted to reinforce the information that they were learning because students are having to really take in a lot of information, not just from your class, but also from other classes. So I always want to keep that information fresh on their mind. So both in the face to face and synchronous um, um, environments, I would incorporate activities throughout lecture. So about every seven to 10 minutes, I would stop and I would quiz the students. And so as I was lecturing, I would pause and say, okay, review and recall time. So someone tell me, what is the number one cause of death for children in low and middle income countries? And they could respond via the mic or they could type it in in the synchronous environment or they would raise their hand face to face. So I was doing that all the time throughout class. And they mentioned in the evaluations how that kept them on top of their game, that kept the information front and center. And it was also a great review for midterm and final exams. I also made sure that I kept my PowerPoint lectures, the length of them, to a minimum. I never went over 10 PowerPoints. None of us like to see 40, 50, 60 slide presentations. It's overwhelming. And I would also make sure that each slide only had about three bullets. Student sharing was also important for me, especially in the public health field and in my global health class. I had a lot of students with a lot of experience and I was learning for them. As Dr. Carnes had said, the chief learner, I was learning from my students. Many of them have traveled extensively to some of the countries we highlighted in our lecture series. So I would have them share five, maybe 10 minutes, Tell me about that experience in Uganda, Cindy, or tell me about that experience in um, Guatemala, um, Ronald, etc. And so I had them share and connect their real world experiences to our lecture, which was very helpful. And I learned a lot from students, but I would also make certain activities extra credit. And one of my previous semesters, I had a student who um, was in charge of the Carolina Clemson blood drive. So because of her participation, I provided her with extra credit. She wrote up a little paper. Any student that volunteered or even gave blood, and I connected that to public health and the value of giving blood, I made sure those students were awarded some extra credit points. Also as well, and I just, I just completed this today for my spring semester asynchronous course, but I made sure that I check in with my students with accommodations on file. So I will individually email them once I receive the paperwork from Disability um, Services. I'll email them and just, you know, of course, introduce myself, but just let them know if there's anything that they need just to reach out to me because I want to make sure that um, they're having a positive classroom experience and that all their needs are being met. And I would make sure that I would connect with them, especially after exams. Did you have enough time as indicated on your accommodations form? Did you have what you needed to perform at your best on my exam or any timed assignments? So I made sure that um, I kept that connection with, my, with those students with accommodations on file. And lastly, um, something that's very important and um, having that clear and consistent communication all the time. I'm very transparent. I like for my students to know exactly where I stand. I'm transparent in the syllabus, in my announcements, but also verbally during lecture. And so um, I let my students know that um, I will stick with a schedule when it comes to Blackboard announcements. Every Sunday, every Wednesday, you will get an announcement at 8 o'clock a.m. So they know they can keep up with that schedule, but it also provides some organization. I made it clear that I respond within 48 hours. So if you send an email at 11, 11 o'clock p.m., you're not going to get a response from me at 11.30 p.m. on a Wednesday. It's not going to happen. So make sure as students, I, would, I was very clear with them, just plan ahead as best as you can. And I will try my best to get back with you within that 48-hour time period. And I did pretty good with sticking with that. So communication is, is critical as well um, when engaging with my students. And that was all I had, just some of my tips and tips and tools that have been helpful for me um, throughout this experience of teaching. Any questions? And you can raise your hand or type a question into the chat box, either one. Uh, there's a, Sean has a question, had a class with 58 students, two-thirds online, 
Uh, he formed five small groups limited to 12 students who would meet outside of class time, and it really helped him connect with the students versus looking at a sea of names. I, I, I love that idea. And again, yes. it's easier to remember the names in smaller groups. Lori has Absolutely. a question. Yeah, Lori has a question. Can you designate some part of a course of service learning if it's not designated as such in the catalog? If the student is trying to get service learning credit as part of the um, graduation with leadership distinction, it does have to have that designation. But you can designate an assignment of service learning just because you want the students involved in the community. So, uh, Nate, anything you want to add on service learning? Uh, actually, you spoke the words that were in my mouth. <laughs> okay. Well, Tina, I really appreciate you sharing your time with me. And I want to, uh, just in, in, in trying to wrap us up, uh, I want to reemphasize the last point you made on communication. Uh, we have had one of the most challenging years you can imagine here on campus. And uh, the amazing thing was how quickly everybody responded uh, back in March when we had to quickly move to remote teaching and how we've had to accommodate uh, students. We're all learning new tools and techniques. Once the pandemic is over, I think we'll be uh, keeping some of these in our repertoire. Others will be looking forward to getting back to having everything face to face so we can look our students in the eye uh, as they're talking. But the one piece of consistent feedback we've received from the students is a desire for more communication. So the more you can connect with your students, and there are a couple different ways you can connect with your students. Um, you know, obviously you want to share information uh, about the course, but sharing things about yourself, sharing the anecdote, anecdotes you have about your career, your life will help them get to know you. That makes a connection. Uh, the idea of sending them emails on a regular basis makes a big difference and personalizing feedback helps out. So left a few minutes for questions. I used to have a plaque on my wall that said, any question is fair. So that might just come from my journalism background, but we'll take questions. You can open your microphone, you can uh, type it into the chat box. Anything that you want to know about anything except football. Oh, okay. Advice for asynchronous courses. Yes, don't, uh, um, I'll let Aisha answer this question as well, but my advice is don't think of it as a uh, week to week to week. Think of it as divide the course into modules and put it in chunks that fit logically together. You're not as time bound as you are in a synchronous class. Um, Aisha? What other tips would you give on asynchronous courses? Yes, you gave a great tip there. I would also say make sure that to make sure that your course is well organized. Um, so you 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 uh, don't want students to have to fish for information in your course. So make sure that your course is well organized, and you can use one of our templates to to you know our, you can use one of our templates to to help you with, with to help you with with that. Um, also, uh, we, we have some we, we have some quality assurance standards uh, for, for the university that will be, be that will be helpful as well. And it's, uh, you can you can also use some, use some of the, the tips that Tina mentioned earlier during her, her presentation in, in regards to communication, and that's very key as well. So I think that those are the the, um, the best tips that I have now. The other tip that I would give is. Sometimes when we're doing asynchronous, we're used to thinking that, okay, the students are going to be off working alone. In an asynchronous environment, you can also connect the students with each other. They can still be involved in group projects, whether they work uh, in a synchronous fashion on the group project or where they connect via email or through Blackboard. But you have a chance for them to learn from each other. Uh, the goal, obviously, you start with your outcomes. What do you want students to learn in your course? And that takes us to another real practical thing. No matter how much you know, no matter how experienced you are, you'll never be able to share all of it with the students in your class. So one of the toughest challenges that we have when we're putting together a course is saying, here are the limits of what I'm going to try to do. Is if you try to throw too much at a person, they're never going to remember everything. But if you say, here are the things I know that I want them to remember, 
not just at the end of the course, but years from now, uh, you're going to have much greater retention and much greater engagement. Uh, another tip from Aisha on asynchronous. When you're doing asynchronous videos, keep the lecture short, 15 to 20 minutes. Make bites so the students can uh, put them together, enjoy them, think about them, or have activities at the conclusion of each, uh, each of those bites. Um, any other questions? Again, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, any problems that you've encountered or any things that, uh, any concerns you have about our students? And, and, and as you're, you're thinking about that, uh, I want to remind you, we've got so, so many great uh, students. This is one of the best student bodies around. I loved it. Uh, about 10 years ago, we increased the uh, admission requirements and uh, uh, the students get, keep getting better and better. Um, uh, the Bonnie asks, will shorter lectures impact the course credit hours? Do we need to create more lectures to fill the time requirement? You have to have activities. So it's a combination of the lectures and the activities that the uh, students are engaged in. And so you put those together. So uh, Nate, you had a, a comment to make? Uh, yes, I'll give a very brief, broad comment was that uh, I appreciate the, the question on asynchronous and the responses. I just want everybody to keep in mind that asynchronous and synchronous are not completely different worlds. There are some competencies that cross so we can learn from one another as well. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks Nate. I wanna thank all of you for taking the time to attend too. Again, we love what we do at CTE and any chance we have to uh, make teaching better, we wanna take advantage of that. And we appreciate you taking the time. Keep in mind, we're here to help you uh, all the time. Uh, so please let us know. We're going to be sending out uh, some information. The libraries has a new uh, faculty guide uh, on their website. We'll send you a link to that. We're also going to send you a link to uh, uh, that will include an evaluation so you can tell us what you liked or what you think we could do better because we're always looking for a way to improve. But most of all, if there's ever a problem, a challenge, a question, let us know. We're here to make your life easier as a teacher so you can focus on the part of teaching that you like the best. Uh, my thanks to Tina Marie, to Nate, to Aisha, and to the great staff. I appreciate all the help from Casey in answering questions. It's Avery Hopkins for helping coordinate everything. So, uh, oh, there's the link to the uh, uh, new faculty and instructor library guide. So uh, it never stops. So again, please call on us. Please let us help you. It's what we like to do best. All right. Everybody, it's time, dinner time. Please go have your dinner, and I will look forward to seeing you all online or in the CTE office soon enough. Thank you. <laughs>